So today is probably my favorite day of the entire semester for probability statistics. Does that make you happy? Maybe, maybe not. This is going to be a true marriage of theory and simulation to help us understand some fundamental concepts in chapter seven, including understanding how to derive the distributions of sums of random variables, x plus y, when we assume those random variables are independent, with moment generating functions, the fingerprint theorem. But I also do want to show you that sometimes you can figure out these distributions without the fingerprint theorem, though it's not easy. And we also want to do simulations on a spreadsheet in Mathematica to help us believe what we're seeing in the theory and also hopefully help us understand the theory better. Okay? So let's start with the example that we ended with last time. Let's assume we've got two random variables, x and y, that both have the same distribution. Let's assume these are both uniform well, the standard example to take is zero to one, but let's make it a little bit more interesting and go zero to 10. So these are assumed to be continuous uniform random variables on the interval from zero to 10. What else do we need to assume? If we're gonna do anything. What's the big assumption we always make? Starts with an I. I mentioned it a minute ago. Independence, yeah. And assume x and y are independent. It is an assumption we make. It's not something we prove here in this context. It's an assumption we're making so that we can do some theory that we hope might be useful. If you don't make the assumption of independence, the work is a lot harder. You can't use the theorem that comes after the fingerprint theorem in particular. The question is, question, what is the distribution of their sum? What is the distribution of the sum? Could call it S, but I want to reserve the letter S for standard deviation. Z comes after X and Y, but I want to reserve the letter Z for standard normal. So that's why I used the letter W just as some other letter to use. That's the question that we want to answer. And I told you what the answer was on Tuesday. It's got a triangular distribution. The probability density function is shaped like a triangle. The PDF for X and Y is really the same function, though it would be good to use different labels because they are different random variables. They got the same distribution, but I am thinking of them as different random variables, meaning when I observe their values, they're gonna be different values in all likelihood. <clears throat> Being uniform on the interval from zero to 10 means in both cases, you get one tenth if the input is between zero and 10 and zero otherwise. And again, since these are continuous, it doesn't matter whether you include the endpoints there or not. Not a big deal. The formula for Fy of Y is the exact same thing, except I'm thinking of the input as being called Y instead of X. It really is the same function, just different labeling. So that's I, I told you what the answer is, triangular. Centered where? Where do you think the, the top of the triangle is? Do you remember? Here's the PDF of X and Y. What do you think the PDF of W looks like? Other than it's a triangle like I told you already. Where do you think it's the peak is? What's the domain where it's positive? I mean the X or the W coordinate of the peak. That's how far you can go. In theory, X and Y can get arbitrarily close to 10 in value, like 9.99999. You add them, if they both are really close to 10, the sum is going to be close to 20. 
So 20 is the right boundary of the domain where the PDF is positive. And if it's symmetric, the peak has got to be at 10. So the graph of the PDF of W I'm claiming looks like this. Without, I'm claiming this without proof. Shaped like a triangle. It's got to have a total area under it equal to one still. Area of a triangle is one half base times height. What height is going to make that equal to one? I think you said it, one tenth. 0 0.1 is the height of this density that's going to make the area of the triangle equal to one, and therefore it will be a valid density. I claim that is the PDF probability density function for W. Let's now think about different ways to confirm that. Okay, this is pretty practical. You could imagine maybe X and Y representing, oh, I don't know, the loss, the damages to a car if you get in an accident in thousands of dollars for two different people, person X and person Y. And these people are independent of each other, so they, they don't know each other. They live in different states. But they got the same kind of car, and they are sort of in a similar environment in terms of the danger of getting in an accident. Actually, maybe I'm assuming they do get in an accident, and this distribution in thousands of dollars represents the damages to their car. Now, of course, it could be, for most cars, it could be more than $10,000 of damages, but just to keep it simple, assume it doesn't go above 10,000. Assume it's uniformly distributed, meaning the probability that the damages between $1,000 and $2,000 is the same as the probability of the damages between $2,000 and $3,000, et cetera. Every $1,000 interval would have the same probability. And every $100 interval would have the same probability. That's because it's a uniform distribution. And then W would be the sum of the damages to the cars of these two people, assuming they get in an accident in the next year. Might not be a good model, but it's, it's something to try. It's something maybe worth trying. And what the model seems to be saying is most likely for the sum, you are insuring these two people and their cars, most likely the sum is gonna be close to 10,000, less likely close to zero or 20,000 because the density is highest near 10. And you integrate the density to find probabilities. And it's symmetric, the mean should be 10. But is this really right? Let's try seeing if we can believe it with some simulation. We'll start with the spreadsheet. Mm. If I do equals 10 times RAND, like that, well, RAND generates a random number between zero and one, a random decimal, with every decimal of a certain finite extent, certain number of decimal places having an equal probability. We're multiplying that by 10, so effectively we get a random decimal number between zero and 10, a random real number between zero and 10. Again, if you copy and paste, it redoes it. Oh, how big, make sure we make the sample size. Let's make it size, say 25, keep it relatively small. So there's 25 data values from a random sample of size 25 from a uniform distribution on the interval from zero to 10. Assuming at least that the spreadsheet is truly random. Is that really the case? Now, actually, technology generates what are called pseudo-random numbers, not random numbers in the purest sense, but it's good enough. You might like having just one set of data to work with. I might like to copy and paste this column to the right and just work with the numbers that you see there and not have them always be updated. You can do that if you do a paste special. And this works in Excel too. You can paste the values only, not the formula. So when I copy and paste the column B here, I'm not really pasting the formula equals rand anymore. I'm pasting these exact numbers that I just got. So the very first one should be the 6.237. Let's see if it is. Yep. But these numbers changed. Well, let's copy and paste those numbers to the next column, column C. And I'll make those 
pay special values as well. So the first one will be 8.417. And once again, those numbers got changed again. But now if I keep copying and pasting, the numbers on the left keep changing, but the numbers in columns B and C don't change anymore because I pasted just their values. You don't see your equals rand when you click on those cells. Those cells. So again, this is this is like a bunch of observed values for X. Damages for this person on their car over the next 25 years, every year. First year, $6.237,000 of damages. Next year, $3.8345,000. And this is person Y. If you graph one of these with a bar chart, essentially looking at a histogram, it's not going to be perfectly uniform because of random variation, but hopefully it looks somewhat uniform. Insert chart, histogram, not a line chart. Okay, relatively uniform, certainly not perfect. Let's get rid of that. What happens if I add the numbers in these two columns? That's modeling the sum of the two random variables. If I type equals B1 plus C1, that's modeling X plus Y, W. And since I kept those fixed, these old numbers will be the same as I copy and paste, paste them down. Can we observe the triangular nature of the distribution just by looking at the numbers? Yeah, I think so. Lots of the numbers are fairly close to 10 is what you should observe. Fairly few of them are close to zero. That's one of them. And fairly few of them are close to 20. Uh, is that, that might be the closest one to 20 there. Most of them are grouped near 10. If we see the histogram for this, we hopefully should see that. Okay, again, it's not perfect, but it makes it believable at least that it's got a triangular distribution. If I did bigger sample sizes, it would be more clear. I didn't doing samples of size 25. If I do bigger sample sizes, it would be more clear. How about trying to confirm that it's got this distribution by hand? Is that possible? Yep. The quickest way is to use the fingerprint theorem as well as the theorem that comes after it. Let's do it that way first. That's what you're mainly gonna be doing on your homework is using the fingerprint theorem. That's this theorem, 7.3.1. Let X and Y be random variables with moment generating functions, MX of T and MY of T. If those moment generating functions happen to be equal on some interval around zero, then X and Y actually have to have the same distribution. In our case, well, X and Y themselves are uniform. They, they are the same, they have the same distribution uniform on the interval from zero to 10. So these two functions for our example are actually the same. That's not really what this problem is about. The, this theorem is about it's not how we're gonna apply it, at least. This is saying if two moment generating functions are the same near zero, then the random variables have the same distribution. Not necessarily, again, the, the same observed values. This theorem is also useful. If you assume the random variables are independent and you let Y be their sum, then the moment generating function for their sum is the product of the moment generating functions, not the sum. Okay, this we're gonna use this first. W is X plus Y. I'm assuming X and Y are independent. That's an assumption I'm making so that I can use this theorem. Is the assumption valid in practice? Mm, it would depend. Certainly car accidents for two different people in two different states that don't know each other and don't interact seems reasonable to assume independence as a model. But if they live in the same household and they drive similar places, then it's not necessarily independent. Or if they always drive together, 
one gets in an accident, maybe the other one caused the accident. Okay, that's that would be an example where the independence assumption would not be valid. So we want to use this here. Well, we need the moment generating function. So go back to chapter four. Look at the table. I've used this book many, many times and I always forget where the table is exactly. Oh, there we go. Near the end of chapter four. Uniform distribution. There's its PDF constant function. B and A are constants, the endpoints of the interval. For X between A and B, that's where this is positive. It's zero otherwise. The moment generating function is this. It's technically a piecewise function. I really noticed that this last time. It's this thing when t is not zero, and it's one if t is zero. That's a piecewise function here. Because technically that's undefined at t equals zero. But it does have a limit evidently of one as t goes to zero, otherwise this wouldn't make sense. Must be a removable discontinuity in this formula. Um, so, if I use that here, A is zero, B is 10, Mx of T equals My of T. You can say these two functions are equal because X and Y have the same distribution. They're not the same random variable, but they have the same distribution. That is enough to say their moment generating functions are equal. And if I use the formula in the book, and okay, I'll go ahead and write it as a piecewise way, in a piecewise way, that's worth doing. E, again, A is zero, B is 10. We're gonna get E to the T times B, which is will be 10 T minus E to the T times A, A is zero. It's gonna give you one, E to the zero is one. Over B minus A, which is 10 times T. This is the formula for the moment generating function if T is not zero and it's one if T equals zero. Essentially, by defining it to both be one at t equals zero, you do make this function continuous at zero. And I believe you even make it differentiable at zero. If you graph this moment generating function near zero, the reason I'm doing this is just to see that it looks continuous. I can only plug in the part where t is non-zero. I'd have to realize I'm assuming it equals one when t is zero. Graph this near t equals zero, like negative two to two. Claiming the limiting value must be one according to this. So I'm gonna let y go from zero to two and see that it looks like the limit is one, hopefully. Yep. That's one. Technically, this formula, again, is undefined at t equals zero. But the limit as t goes to zero exists. You could use L'Hopital's rule to verify that if you wanted to. N equals one. And so if you fill in the value of one when t is zero, you've made it a continuous function. And I do believe it's differentiable as well. In fact, probably infinitely differentiable by filling in that to be one. I'm not proving that, but. So what's the moment generating function of W? Oops. Independence. And the theorem. Theorem coming after the fingerprint theorem, 7.3.2. Imply that the moment generating function of W is the product of the moment generating function of X and the moment generating function of Y. So technically speaking, it's the square of this when T is non-zero. So I'd write that it maybe as E to the 10 T minus one quantity squared over square of the bottom, I get hundred T squared. 
if t is non-zero, and one squared, which is one, if t is zero. I haven't used the fingerprint theorem yet. How would I use the fingerprint theorem? I'm trying to identify the distribution of W. Here is its moment generating function. If I can show that this PDF, a random variable with this PDF, has the same moment generating function, then I'd be done. Then the fingerprint theorem would imply they have the same distribution, W, along with any random variable having this distribution, this triangular distribution. Oh, but that means <clears throat> I need to find the moment generating function for a random variable with this distribution by the definition of the moment generating function. That does involve doing an integral. And this is moreover, this is a piecewise function that's got two pieces where the graph is non-zero. I will go ahead and call it F sub capital W of little w. What would it equal? This line here has a slope of 0.1 over 10, that's rise over run, which is 0 0.01 or 1 one hundredth times W, making my little W cursive so you can tell it from the big W. That's if W is between zero and 10. Go ahead and include the 10 if you like. And this piece has a slope of negative one over 100, What's its y-intercept? Well, should be 0.2, one-fifth. I mean, you also could write the formula, thinking about the fact that this is the w-intercept of that line right there. You could write the formula as negative one over 100 times in parentheses w minus 20, because you want that intercept to be at w equals 20. And if you just distribute the negative one over 100 through negative one over 100 times negative 20 is positive one fifth. So yeah, that works. That's if W is between zero and 10 and 20. These do much match up in value when W is 10. They're both equal to 0 0.1 when W is 10. So that's, that is what I claim is the PDF of W. I haven't proved that yet because I, I still haven't applied the fingerprint theorem yet. I'm going ahead and giving it this name anyway, assuming I'm right, and, and yes, I am right. So I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and give it this name anyway, but what I need to do if I'm gonna apply the fingerprint theorem is I need to calculate the, this moment generating function from the definition and show it equals this. Yeah, that'll involve doing integrals. So the moment generating function of W from the definition of the moment generating function was it blurry the past few minutes okay. I got to pay attention to whether it's blurry or not or not but definition that's the expected value of e to the tw right that's the moment generating function for any random variable <clears throat> um okay what i'm what i'm trying to do again i'm 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 trying to show w has this moment generating function by assuming this is maybe like a different w that has the same distribution that i'm after so I'm not, what I'm trying to say is I'm not doing circular reasoning here when I say this is the integral from zero to 20 of e to the tw times this function I'm proposing is the PDF of the sum. I haven't proved it's the PDF of the sum yet, but I'm proposing it's the PDF of the sum, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in there. Since this PDF is piecewise, you're going to want to break this up into two integrals, integral from 0 to 10 plus an integral from 10 to 20. 
the formula when w is between 0 and 10 is 1 over 100 times w. And the formula when w goes between 0 and 20 is negative 1 over 100 w plus 1 fifth. These integrals are certainly doable by hand. And if I was feeling grumpy and put them on exam three, theoretically you should be able to do them by hand. But it would be very easy to make a mistake and it might take a while. I'm afraid I'm gonna make a mistake. You would use integration by parts if you're gonna do them from scratch by hand. With this one, let u equal one over hundred w, let v prime be e to the tw. T, think of t as fixed. W is the variable. Here, you'd want to let that be u and this be v prime. It'd be doable. It'd be a pain. I might have a 50% chance of making a mistake. Let's have Mathematica do it now. So we're using technology, trying to use technology in smart ways today to help us do calculations and confirm things with simulation. So integral from zero to 10, E in Mathematica is capital E. Integrating with respect to W, you treat the T as a constant. The answer is going to depend on t, just like the moment generating function depends on t. Will Mathematica have any issues with this since it doesn't know what uh, t is? Does Mathematica need to know what t is? I think it'll be. I think it'll be fine. Oh, beautiful! Hey, and the bottom of those fractions look good. 100 t squared. What about the top? Well, we need to add these two fractions. They already have a common denominator of 100 t squared. Together, we'll add them. Percent is the preceding output. Oh, that looks promising. Yeah, that, that's what I wrote down. Right there. What about the one? Well, what's the limit of this as t goes to zero? Is it one? Yeah. So we have verified from the definition of the moment generating function that if I've got a random variable with this PDF, its moment generating function is going to be this function, which is the same thing I got from theorem 7.3.2. Now I can apply the fingerprint theorem. I can say, therefore, by the fingerprint theorem, when I thought of it this way and got this moment generating function, I know this W, which is the sum of X and Y, has to have this PDF. So I was justified in, in labeling it with this, with the sub W there. Question? Instead of using integrals, could we just use um, the properties of expected value like we did in the homework to find that the moment generating function of W is the two other moment generating functions multiplied together? And then I that's essentially what I did here. But now I'm trying to confirm you get the same answer with this with an integral. Is there any other way to confirm? Yes, there actually is. And I do want to do it. Why? Because it's good practice using things you've learned about in chapter five. And this technique I'm about to show you, I'm going to show you in another situation next week for a different situation. So it's a worthwhile thing to learn. It's actually a very, very powerful method. It's called the CDF method. Oh, 
for first finding the CDF of W and then differentiating it to find the PDF and see that we get the exact same PDF. But it does have a downside. And the downside is we need to think about doing a double integral. It's not so bad for this example, but it's still tricky. We gotta be really careful. What is the CDF, capital F, subcapital W of little w? I'd like to find this and then again differentiate it to find the PDF. And one key to finding the CDF is to realize, to remember that it is always this kind of probability. Always, always, always. The CDF, capital F of any random variable, actually discrete or continuous, it doesn't matter, with respect to the given variable name is the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to the given variable. That the random variable is less than or equal to the given variable. Yeah, w, capital W is the random variable, little w is just a, a given number, an ordinary variable that represents an arbitrary number. Random variables are not numbers. They're abstract ideas. You can find the probabilities that they are less than or equal to numbers, they, that they, their observed values are less than or equal to something. But in the abstract, they are not numbers. Little w is a number. Just not saying what number it is. We do need to think about this in cases, which is not so surprising since the answer involves cases. Oh, and I forgot to say zero otherwise. <clears throat> so it's not so surprising that it's cases. Wait a minute, what is W? It's X plus Y. How in the world am I gonna find that probability? Use chapter five, use a joint PDF. Why? The assumption of independence is helpful. Independence implies that the joint PDF of X and Y is the product of their PDFs, which you could also call marginal PDFs if you like. <clears throat> Think about this. X and Y have the same PDF. Output equal to one tenth if the input is between zero and 10 and zero otherwise. We're multiplying those. We're gonna get an output of one tenth quantity squared, one one hundredth. If what? If both X and Y are between zero and one, or 10, excuse me. And zero otherwise. In the XY plane, the domain where this joint PDF is positive is a square. Like this. And it's zero everywhere else. Its graph in three-dimensional graph is a horizontal plane above that square with a height of one one hundredth, very close to the horizontal plane and zero otherwise. This expression here, x plus y being less than or equal to little w, is essentially a, a, an inequality that describes an event to this joint PDF. Now we don't know what w is. Let's start by pretending W is between zero and 10. That seems like a reasonable thing to try perhaps since we know what the answer is. What if W is between zero and 10? Case one, 
where should I put it? Case one. W is between zero and 10. I'll go ahead and include the boundary of 10. What does it mean for X plus Y to be less than or equal to W? It means X plus Y is relatively small, close to the origin, I guess. Below this line, that's the line X plus Y equals W. I'm not saying what W is, so I don't know exactly where this line is, other than to say, well, if W is between zero and 10, it's gotta look like this because W is the Y intercept. It's actually also the X intercept. Think of W as fixed. For example, if W is six, then this would be X plus Y equals six. That would be six there. This would be six here. I didn't draw it perfectly. It looks more like five the way I drew it, I guess. X plus by Y being less than or equal to W represents this triangular region. That's the region, region where X plus Y is less than or equal to W. That's the region you would integrate it over to get this probability. Do you literally have to do a double integral here? You actually don't because of something nice that happens in this example. Why can we actually avoid doing an integral here? What's nice about this example? What's the, in everything you see, what's besides the independence assumption, what's the nicest thing you see here? And besides the fact that triangles and squares are nice, I'm thinking like right in here. Yeah, the function's constant when you're in the square. So the double integral finds a volume under the graph. It's just going to be the area of this of this triangle times the height. You don't have to do an integral. Find the area of that triangle and multiply times one over 100. What's the area of this triangle? It depends on W, doesn't it? As it should, and this is gonna be a function of W. One half base times height, one half W times W. One half W squared. Don't forget to multiply by one over a hundred. In case one. In other words, that's one over 200 W squared which has derivative with respect to W equal to one over a hundred W. Why is that good? That's a DDW there. One over a hundred W. Right, that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to derive the PDF. I need to differentiate the CDF. Case two sounds like it looks like it's going to be harder, right? That's got to be the derivative. Case two. Dare I draw it in the same picture? Case two. W is between 10 and 20. This line X plus Y equals W still represents the boundary of the event we're interested in, but to draw it, you'd want to draw it up here. So this corresponds to case one. This line, X plus Y equals W, corresponds to case two. So the area 
in question now, how should I shade it? Like this, is the area of a rectangle and the area of a trapezoid. However, we can save a little work by also realizing it's the area of the entire square minus the area of this triangle. Catch that? You should see where I was pointing. This blue shaded area is the area of the entire square minus the area of the unshaded triangle. Don't forget to multiply by one over 100. One over 100, because that's the height of the graph. We're trying to find a volume in the end under a graph. The area of the entire square is 10 times 10, 100, minus the area of that unshaded triangle, one half base times height. But what is the base and what is the height? This is the trickiest part right now. What's the base and what's the height? Hmm. Probably would be helpful to figure out the coordinates of those points in terms of W. Certainly the second coordinate of that point is 10. What's its first coordinate? It depends on W. It's on the line x plus y equals w. So, and I know y is 10. So if I plug in y equals 10 and solve for x, that'll give me the x coordinate. w minus 10? Yeah, w minus 10. And this point is symmetric. Its x coordinate is 10. And its y coordinate is w minus 10. So the base and the height of the unshaded rect uh, triangle are the same. And there would be 10 minus w minus 10. Confusing, huh? Those lines here and here have length. equals 10 minus W minus 10, right? If, for example, if W were 14, W minus 10 would be four. The first coordinate of that point would be four. 10 minus four is six. 10 minus four, if W were 14. Simplify, you get 20 minus W. Yeah, when W is 10, this is 10, the triangle is half the square. On the flip side, when W gets up to 20, this becomes zero, it becomes a degenerate triangle, a non-existent triangle at just that point when W is 20. So that's both the base and the height. Looks like we get 20 minus W quantity squared. if W is between 10 and 20. Uh, probably should try to simplify that before differentiating it. I can distribute the one over 100 through. One over 100 times 100 is one, times one half is one over 200. Square this, you'll get 20 squared is 400 minus 40W plus W squared. Distribute the minus one over 200. Be careful. There's a one fifth, yay, that makes me happy. Uh, get this, which simplifies to, okay, let's write it this way. Negative one over 200 W squared plus one fifth W minus one. That's the CDF value when W is between 10 and 20. Now, it's not obvious looking at this formula, but if you graph the CDF by combining these two formulas, that one there with this one here, 
They would match up at W equals 10 and have a value of one half when W equals 10. Let's double check that. 10 squared is 100 divided by 200 is a half. Plug in W equals 10 right there. 10 squared, again, 100. This becomes a negative one half. One fifth times 10 is two, negative one half. Plus two is 1.5, minus one is 0.5. The graph of the CDF, when it's not constant, is made up of two parabolas that match up in the way you see here. And yeah, if you differentiate this, this piece, DDW, you get negative one over 100 W plus one fifth, just like we were hoping. That was the hardest method, though. But sometimes it's necessary. We're not going to do a problem like this, but let me just mention when this kind of approach is necessary. It's necessary to do this approach when X and Y are not independent. The other approaches needed independence. Independence there to get this. Um, where did I need independence here? Did I need it or not? I guess I didn't need it because I, I knew what the answer was going to be with that approach. You do have to use, you can't use the moment generating function approach if X and Y are not independent. But this approach still works, but don't use this. Instead, what you have to do is you have to come up with a joint PDF that is valid when X and Y are not independent. How do you do that? Uh, it depends, and that's a and pun intended. It depends on the situation. It depends on some other hypothesis about some other possible relationship between X and Y. You would not be able to find the joint PDF by multiplying the marginal PDFs. Instead, you'd have to come up with some other formula for the joint PDF that you think is valid. But thinking in terms of integration, which we were really doing here without doing an integral, would be the way to go. It would not be easy, but it would be conceivably doable. Wow. A lot of stuff there, a lot of stuff to think about, but important. The most important of which is, was our first method. But this CDF method, I am going to show you next week another example where it's useful and not quite as hard as this one. So it's worth learning about. We won't have to do a double integral though. What would happen if I add two normal random variables? <clears throat> oh, to keep it simple, let's assume they are this they have the same distribution. Normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And assume X and Y are independent. Let W be their sum. Same question as before. Question, what is the distribution of W? Best way to go is with our first method. Use moment generating functions. So for a normal random variable, there's the PDF. 
Here's the moment generating function. A little difficult to see there. E to the mu times T plus sigma squared T squared over two power. This assumption means mx of t and my of t are the same, and they are both equal to e to the mu times t power plus sigma squared t squared over two. That that entire thing's the power of e. By the way, for typesetting reasons, maybe you've noticed this already, Sometimes we'd write this with EXP notation. This means the same thing. This means E to this power. The reason it's done sometimes this way is because typesetting wise in books, this gets kind of messy. Okay, so just like before, independence And theorem 7.3.2 implies that the moment generating function of W, MW of T, is the product of the moment generating functions of X and Y. I'm adding the random variables, but I'm multiplying their moment generating functions. This is good. You wouldn't want to add them. In other words, I'm multiplying this thing times itself. I'm squaring it, which by properties of exponents means I can just add those exponents. Mu t plus mu t, t add like terms, is two mu t. Sigma squared t squared over two plus sigma squared t squared over two is sigma squared t squared. However, that's best to write as two sigma squared t squared over two. Reason being is we've now rewritten this moment generating function in a way that specifies it's the same moment generating function as a normal random variable with mean two mu and variance careful, variance two sigma squared, standard deviation, square root of two times sigma. The fingerprint theorem, fingerprint theorem. Now, FPT for fingerprint theorem now implies that since W has this moment generating function, the moment generating function for a normal random variable with this mean and this variance, that means W has that distribution. It's normal with mean two mu and variance two sigma squared. If X is my bowling score, you know, Dr. Wetzel talked about bowling. I forgot what he said his mean score is. What did he say, 150 or so? And his variance was, I don't know, a thousand. I don't remember. Standard deviation of 30 or something. I'm not as good of a bowler as Dr. Wetzel. My mean, I haven't gone in a long time. My mean, if I had to guess, might be 125. Standard deviation of around 25. So my variance would be like 625. So this would be me. X, normal, mean 125, variance. 25 squared, so 625. Oh, okay. For this example, at least, I'd have to assume I bowled twice. Then It's not me and Dr. Wetzel bowling. I want to have the, have the same distribution to apply what I just did here. So it's, it's X, is my, X is my score on my first game and Y is my score on my second game. What's the distribution of my sum? 
should be normal with mean of 250 and variance of 1250. And that would mean the standard deviation would not be 25, but instead would be, and it's not 50, it'd be square root of two times 25. 1250 square root is the same as square root of uh, 25 times the square root of two. My standard deviation of the sum would be not 50, but about 35.4. But wait a minute, how can individual bowling scores, bowl first game, bowl second game, how can they have a distribution? Aren't they just particular numbers? No, those are just observed values on one particular day. Maybe I go bowling every day, every day I bowl two games when I'm feeling fresh and rested and not hungry. Same time every day, I bowl two games in a row X represents my first my score on my first bowling game on a given day. Y is the second game. There's a little bit of a caveat here that I haven't mentioned. X plus Y is their sum. But then the next day, they have new observed values. What, what's the possible fly in the ointment in all this? In application to my bowling scores. Uh huh. Yeah, there's that. There's also the fact that maybe if I have a really good game the first game, I don't know, I'm just feeling really good about myself and maybe that makes it more likely that I get a good score in my second game. Or maybe the first game makes me really tired and so I'm liable to do worse in the second game. They're not necessarily independent the point is. So it's not a perfect application. You might wonder, what if they had different means and different variances? Could I still use this approach? Yes, you can. And that'll come up on a homework problem or two. Another important example so this is adding two normal random variables with the same distribution. Another important example is adding two chi-squared random variables. Let's say with different degrees of freedom. Say x is chi-square, how should I not notate that? I could write chi for chi. It's more fun to use a chi like that, that's nice and big. That's a beautiful looking chi. Chi square distribution, the parameter is the degrees of freedom. Let's say the degrees of freedom is three. That's the DF denoted little gamma one say. And Y is chi square with four degrees of freedom. Once again, that's a chi. And this here is a degrees of freedom, little gamma two say. Assume X and Y are independent again so that we can use the theorems. In particular, so we can use the second theorem, the theorem 7.3.2. Let W equal X plus Y. What is the distribution of W? We use the theorem to figure out its moment generating function to be the product of these two moment generating functions. And these moment generating functions for X and Y are different because X and Y have just different distributions. Looking in the table, That's the kind of moment generating function we're after where little gamma is the degrees of freedom. This becomes one minus two T to the power of negative gamma over two with X gamma is three. And with Y gamma is four, negative four over two is negative two. 
simplify by adding the exponents to get negative seven halves for the exponent. And that is the moment generating function for a chi-squared random variable with seven degrees of freedom. The fingerprint theorem now implies that W is chi-squared with seven degrees of freedom. That's the gamma. And do note seven is three plus four. We added the two degrees of freedom from X and Y to get the degrees of freedom for their sum. Not an accident. Adding independent chi-squared random variables gives you a chi-squared random variable whose degrees of freedom is the sum of the degrees of freedom for the starting random variables. Very important example. You have a bunch of problems rel related to all this stuff that, that you're going to look at it for the homework due Thursday and it's going to look really hard. They're kind of theoretical questions for the homework due Thursday. But they are similar in nature to these. We're using the theorems in the book, this moment generating function technique. There's other theorems in the book that you might be able to use as well. Let's point those out. You might need to use this theorem. that allows you to calculate a moment generating function for a random variable that is a, a linear function of another random variable. Y is alpha plus beta times X. Nothing about independence there, but this formula tells you how to compute the moment generating function for Y in terms of the moment generating function for X. Notice in that moment generating function for X, you do not plug in T, you plug in beta times T. Another important theorem is this one. <clears throat> Dr. Wetzel always called this the cornerstone theorem because it's important, Corn just like cornerstones are important in buildings. He called this the cornerstone theorem. I guess I'll call it the cornerstone theorem. Let x1 through xn be a random sample of size n from a normal distribution. This is about sums of normal random variables. Same mean, same variance. These all have the same distribution. That's what random samples have to have, actually, is they all always have to be from the same distribution. Then x bar, the sample mean, is also normally distributed with the same mean. This is not the sum of the x's, that's the sum divided by n. The sum of the x's would have a mean of n times mu, just like my example from 10 minutes ago had a mean of two mu. But we're dividing by n, this is a mean, not a sum. It's the sum divided by n. It's got the same mean as the original population. It's also normally distributed. The variance is different though. It's not sigma squared, it's sigma squared divided by n. This is a very important theorem. You might argue that in real life, it's never exactly applicable because whenever you ever gonna have random variables that are exactly for sure, without a doubt, exactly normal. In real, real life is messy, right? Things are hardly ever perfect, perfectly normal. But that's, that's not the point. The point is to not to say this never applies to a situation exactly. The point is that we are building models, probability models for use in statistics. And our models are based on assumptions like the assumption of normality, just like the assumption of independence. And if we make the assumption of normality in our theoretical model building that we hope to apply approximately in real life, then we do need this theorem for the theoretical model building.
Why do you divide by n? For the variance. Intuitively, it's because for large sample sizes, we actually already saw this a little bit, there's not as much variability in x bar. Actually, this theorem, in part, we've already seen earlier in chapter seven. It's similar to this theorem. This theorem says you got a population with mean mu and variance sigma squared. The variance of x bar, x bar sample mean is a statistic, means it's a random variable. It's got a distribution. It's got a mean. It's got a variance. The variance is sigma squared over n. Same thing as in the cornerstone theorem, sigma squared over n. Ah, went into chapter eight. Sorry. Sigma squared over n. So is this something new? Yeah, it's new. The thing that's new about it is assuming you got a normal population. So we actually already knew the mean had to be mu and the variance had to be sigma squared over n. What's new is that if the population is normal, then the mean itself is normal. That's the new thing. Yeah, large sample sizes tends to make the variance smaller. The, the observed values of X bar over many, many samples from the same population don't vary as much with large sample sizes because the outliers that you get once in a while are averaged out. I still may assign, even though I haven't had time to talk about section 7.4, something called interval estimation and the central limit theorem, I may still give you a few problems where you use this formula, uh, excuse me, where you use the formula right uh, here to calculate something called a confidence interval. It's just a matter of using the formula. I don't have time in our last five minutes to talk about it because I do want to end class with another simulation. Okay, but I may assign a problem or two where you use this. Just plug the numbers in the formula. You got to calculate, in a given situation, you got to calculate an observed value of X bar for a given sample size n and, and plug in the, into this formula. The z sub alpha over two is a number you get from the table. Like z sub 0 0.05 would be a number on the z axis where the area under the graph to the right is 0 0.05. We've done that kind of thing before. Let's end class with a simulation with an aim to illustrate this idea here. Actually, a generalization of this idea called the central limit theorem. This is an exact theorem that can be proved to say X bar is exactly normally distributed in this situation. However, even if the population is not normal, the central limit theorem says X bar is approximately normal when the sample size is large enough. So let's see if that happens here. Go back to a spreadsheet. What I'm about to show you, we've done before. Let's go ahead and do samples of size 25 from a uniform distribution over and over and over again. How many times? Uh, let's do it 20 times. Uh, I have to add. Uh, let's do it 20 times. So there's 26 letters in the alphabet. If we do it 20 times, we need to go to column Y here. So what we've got here are going to be 20, 20 samples of size 25 from a uniform distribution on the interval from 0 to 10. You make histograms for any one of these columns, it should be relatively uniform. But if you compute the mean of all these, equals average, and graph those 
20 numbers. They're all relatively close to five. None of them are below three or bigger than seven, say. And if you graph them, probably don't have enough of them to see it very well, but make a, make a, a histogram should be fairly normal looking. Oh boy, is, is it going to be? Oh, that, that one looks good. Yeah, doesn't look too bad. Looks like a normal curve somewhat. Centered near five as it should be. What's its standard deviation? Should be the variance of that uniform distribution divided by n, the sample size, which is 25. That would be, that'd be the variance of this. The variance, once more to the table, the variance of a uniform distribution on the interval from B to A, A to B, is that. So for us, that's 10 squared over 12. 100 over 12 is 8.3 repeating, I think. Square root of that is the standard deviation, a little less than three. Divide that by 25. That's sigma squared right there. Divide that by 25 to get sigma squared over n. 0.115. That histogram should have standard deviation close to 0.1. Uh, it doesn't, it's hard to tell if it does. I mean, these, these bars over here are, are low. We would need a finer scale to see it well. Oh, wait a minute. That's the variance. So the stand, uh, no, the, excuse me, I'm doing this wrong. The variance is going to be this. Standard deviation is going to be the square root of that, close to 0. 0.6. Okay, that seems more reasonable. Take sigma squared divided by n before you take the square root. We we're looking at an approximation to the distribution of x bar there in that graph. Have a good day.